All right, well, this morning we're returning to Luke chapter 9. The, the chapters in Luke are, are quite long, um, even though it's, it's shorter in the number of chapters, say, between Luke and Matthew. It's actually much longer than Matthew because the chapters are so much longer. Uh, one other thing about Luke that we need to understand is, um, you know, that each of the gospel writers shaped the material according to, you know, uh, well, let's just say not necessarily according to chronology. Uh, they may have had a different purpose in the way that they have worked it out. So Luke doesn't always give us perhaps the, these things in order, but what he gives to us is um, certainly true and important and exactly what actually did take place, and we need to understand what it is. Now, in this um, particular passage, as I've said, the theme is mercy. And uh, I think we'll be able to <laughs> resonate with it right away as I, as I read. So let's read, first of all, verses 51 through 56, and then we'll look at this. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Again, I think a very <laughs> important lesson for us here. Now, um, Luke tells us that the days uh, were now drawing near for our Lord's ascension. Basically, the time when his humiliation uh, would, would basically come to an end, his, his self-emptying to become one with us. Remember when Jesus, being God, became man, he didn't empty himself of divinity. But rather, he took to himself humanity. The Creator took a creature and... Um, basically merged the two, he didn't merge the two natures together, but he joined them in one person. And we call this, of course, the, the self-emptying of Jesus, but this is his humiliation. And he came into a sinful world to live among a sinful people and to do what he needed to do and to endure what he needed to endure in order to save us. Well, the time was coming when that would come to an end. There were still a few things ahead of him, though. He had to be betrayed. He had to be condemned. He had to be crucified by the Romans. He had to die, die as a criminal, die as a curse for us on the cross. But then his exaltation would begin, that is, after his burial, okay? His exaltation would begin first with his resurrection, then his appearances to his disciples to show that he was alive. And finally, it would reach its, its culmination, its climax, in his being lifted up to heaven. You know, the ascension is basically on the church calendar. It's something that churches celebrate. Even though the Lord didn't specifically tell us to celebrate that, it's still a very important event that we may need to pay attention to. But it's much more important than Jesus simply moving from earth to heaven. It, it was his coronation day, the day that he would receive the honor and the glory from his father that his father had promised him, as well as the promise that all of his enemies would be one day subdued under his feet. As the author to the Hebrews writes, and here he's quoting Psalm 110, in Hebrews 10, verses 12 through 13. But he, that is our Lord Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. That's that place, of course, of honor and authority and rule over all the creation, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. See, when Paul tells us in Philippians 2.10 that one day every knee will bow to him, that's essentially what he's talking about, is the promise the Father has given to him, where he says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, we know this is going to happen in one of two ways. Either his enemies are going to do this willingly from the heart because of the Spirit's working in them uh, through the gospel by his infinite mercy, and by the way, that's the reason why we love him and why we're trusting him and why we've left everything to follow him. We'll either do this willingly, in which case we'll no longer be enemies, but friends of Jesus and, of course, his brothers and sisters and the children of God. Or 
this will happen to uh, others unwillingly when they appear before him on the day of judgment. Every knee will bow to him. But now for the ascension to take place, and this again climax of his uh, exaltation, Jesus had to go to Jerusalem because this is where he must die. At the center of Jewish worship, where the sacrifices were continually made, all of which were pointing to the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And we see that Jesus was determined to go there. You know, most people run away from danger. We don't want to go where we know our life's going to be threatened. But Jesus was determined he was going to go there, knowing what it is that he had to face. Because Jesus had really only a single goal in life. He had a single mind to accomplish that work that his father had sent him into the world to do. So much depended on Jesus completing this work, and that's why he was willing to do it. The father's glory, the father really could not forgive except Jesus make this payment, okay? It's impossible for the Lord really to, to forgive or to show mercy or to show grace unless there's a just basis for it because God is a just God. Jesus is that, ba that, that just basis. He's the one who's made the payment. So Jesus had to lay down his life for the Father's glory. He had to lay down his life for his own glory, the promise that the Father gave him for doing this work. And he realized, of course, and was determined to go there because he had to lay down his life for us, for our salvation. We are a, a very large part of that reward that Jesus is going to receive for the work that he's done. We are the bride that he is going to marry. Now, you know, the Bible tells us that we are to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our example. And as we see Jesus had a single goal in life, really, we are to have a single goal in our lives as well because, you know, our lives are to mirror his. We are to finish the work that the Lord has called us to do, that he sent us into the world to do, that we might honor him, that we might honor the Father, that we might help by gathering together those the Father will give to Jesus on that final day so that we might receive the reward that they have to give us. Remember, we saw not too long ago that our reward appears in, in places in Scripture to be based upon what it is we do towards leading the, the lost to faith in Jesus. Those who lead the many to righteousness will shine like the stars in the heavens. That's why our Lord Jesus calls us to pick up our crosses and to run the race with our eyes fixed upon Him to consider him, to use him as our model and our example. Now, this morning, we see a little bit more of that model that Jesus has given to us, how we are to do this work that the Lord has called us to, particularly in reaching out to others with the gospel, even though they are enemies, and that is by showing mercy, by being merciful. Now, I believe that uh, Jesus was then in Galilee, and he appears now to be moving towards Jerusalem, setting his face, as, as I think Luke will tell us later, like flint towards Jerusalem. He would not be moved. It's unclear whether this was his last trip, and I think that has to do again with chronology of, of Luke, or whether what everything Luke says from this point on is essentially describing what happens on that trip to Jerusalem, or again, whether he was simply going up to Jerusalem for another one of the feasts, but either way, he was going to Jerusalem, okay, and he was in Galilee. But to get to Jerusalem from Galilee, uh, he decided he was going to go through Samaria. Now, if you look at a map, you'll see that Samaria was not really a very, it wasn't a small region, it was actually quite sizable. It was bigger than Galilee, maybe about half the size of Judea, which was the larger portion of Palestine, and it stood directly between Galilee and Judea. It was very difficult to go around. You know, it's, again, it's a very large area. It would mean basically going to, well, you, you really couldn't go to the, to the Mediterranean and swim. But what you could do is you could go the other direction towards the east, cross the Jordan, go down to the south, cross the Jordan again, and go back into Judea. Now, if you went through Samaria, it was a three-day journey on foot. But if you took the long way around, you would add two more days to your trip. So it was a lot easier simply to go through. Now, we also need to understand that because of the size of, the, of Samaria, that Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well of Samaria, at Sychar, remember, and the city's conversion there, is really something that was 
unknown to most of the Samaritans, and I think we see something of that here. So as they were traveling through Samaria, Jesus sends messengers ahead to one of the villages to make arrangements for the night. I mean, it's a three-day journey. You're not going to get through in one day. So you have to spend the night somewhere. He sent messengers ahead to prepare the way. But when the Samaritans understood where Jesus was going, that he was going to Jerusalem, they refused to put him up. They didn't want him to stay there. Now, we do remember that the Jews and the Samaritans had a long-standing disagreement on where it is they should worship God. Remember, the Samaritans at least thought they were worshiping God. The Samaritans are basically half Jewish and, and half pagan, but they had some kind of a Jewish religion, and they kept it separate from the Jews, and they believed that where they should worship was, of course, a different place than the Jews. They believed that uh, they should worship at Mount Gerizim which is the mountain where the Lord told uh, his people as they were entering into the land of promise that they should go and pronounce the blessings when they came into the land, whereas the Jews believed that they should worship at Jerusalem, which we know is the center of Jewish worship and the right place to do so. But the Samaritans, as they understood he was going to Jerusalem, Jerusalem in particular, they, they found that to be very distasteful, and so they closed the doors. Okay, and so... James and John decided to take the, the bull by the horns, as it were. They decided to get involved. And they, they basically, Luke writes this. When, the, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Now, isn't, isn't that the way that most people respond? To, well, not necessarily. Now, James and John, as you know, they were called Boanerges, you know, or Boergenes, the the sons of thunder, and they weren't called that for nothing. These two young men were very zealous, weren't they? They were zealous for Jesus' glory, even as they were zealous for their own glory. Remember, it, they had just been bickering about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I think James and John were probably at the center of that particular debate because it wouldn't be too long, remember, that they would come with their mother to Jesus and say, Jesus, we want in your kingdom to have the two places of greatest honor. And what better way to show Jesus that they deserve these places than to repay these Samaritans for turning Jesus away in the same way that Elijah repaid the prophets of Baal and Asherah on Mount Carmel for turning God's people away from their Lord, fire from heaven. And I think at the same time, perhaps being overcome with their own sin and their own passions, they wanted a certain measure of revenge, okay, to see God's justice poured out on them. And notice they didn't ask Jesus to do it. They said, Jesus, do you want us to command fire from heaven to come down and destroy them? Why did they want to do it, okay? maybe it would give them a, a little greater sense of satisfaction knowing that the Samaritans perished at their hands. Now, we do need to step back just for a second and consider the situation because they weren't necessarily altogether wrong, at least with regard to what the Samaritans deserved. Okay, this is what they deserved. Jesus deserved better than what they had dished out to him. I mean, think about who Jesus is. Jesus is God in our nature. He is the Lord of glory. He is the creator of mankind. He is the one who is worthy of infinite love and worship, but certainly all that we can give him, even as we just basically prayed in our opening hymn, take my body, spirit, soul, only you possess the whole. That is what Jesus is worthy of. But they said, Jesus, get out of here. We don't want your kind around here. You're going to Jerusalem. Now, think about if the Samaritans had done this to a Roman official. <laughs> what would have been the results of that? Well, the Roman official would probably send his army to that village and level it, right? He would probably destroy them. Well, then, if, if that is what, you know, let's say, the Roman official perhaps deserved at least better treatment, how much more does Jesus deserve better treatment? Do you realize that fire from heaven is what they deserve for what they did to him? basically for everything that they've done. It's what the prophets of Baal and Asherah deserve for turning God's people away from God. It's actually what we deserve, isn't it? 
for the sins that we have committed, for each and every single one of them against the Father and the Son, Jesus. You know, we deserve worse than fire from heaven to, to consume us into ashes on the earth. What we actually deserve is the eternal fire. And that's what we would have received. That's what we deserve. You see, we don't understand the grace of God unless we understand what it is we actually deserve. That's what we deserve. But that's not what the Lord has given to us. He's given to us grace because of what Jesus Christ has done. So these Samaritans actually deserve what James and John were, were asking Jesus that they might be able to do. But we need to look at what Jesus had to say about their plan to exact judgment. He says in verses 55 and 56, Luke writes this, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Now this is interesting, isn't it? Because this is what they deserve, but that's not what Jesus wanted them to have. Rebuke means to denounce what they said to disapprove strongly of what it is that they had intended to do. Now, the question is, why did Jesus disapprove? Is it because Jesus did not think that that's what they deserved? Well, no. Jesus knew the justice of God better than anyone. He knew this is what they deserved, not just for what they had done to him, but for, for everything else they had done against the Father, for all of their crimes, all of their sins, as well as, of course, Adam's sin that basically destroys us as we come into the world. But there were several things that were wrong with their statement. The first one was this. This was not something the disciples were supposed to prosecute. Judgment is God's prerogative. It belongs to Him. Remember what I read in Romans chapter 12, what Paul wrote. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. Notice he's saying, don't take revenge because they don't deserve it. They deserve it, but don't you take revenge. If there is revenge to be meted out, this is something that God is going to do. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. God is just. God is going to execute his wrath someday, but it's in his hands to do. Second problem is they had the wrong attitude, the wrong spirit. They wanted vengeance when what they should have desired is mercy. That's why Paul writes in the next verse in Romans 12, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. You know, don't, don't attack him with the spear. Don't try to destroy him. Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Because if they showed mercy, God would take care of the justice part of it, right? He goes on to say, for in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. You know, I've heard this explained before, uh, the idea that what, what Paul is saying is that um, if you feed him, if you give him a drink, it'd be like taking a bucket, filling it with coals so the person could carry it on their head, <laughs> although a bucket with coals wouldn't be terribly comfortable on top of your head, to their house to ignite a fire so that they can keep themselves warm, that that's what he's talking about here. But that's actually not what he's saying. What he's talking about is God, his fiery wrath. You will bring that down on their heads. Now, you don't do it for that reason. You're supposed to show mercy. If God's going to repay, He's the one who's going to do it. So if we repay good for evil, then there's a couple of things that are going to happen. First of all, the Lord might use that to change their hearts. If your enemy is attacking you and you show kindness to him, sometimes that turns them around, turns around their attitude. The Lord uses that maybe even to save them, to bring them to himself. That's why the Lord wants us to show mercy. But if he doesn't use it for that purpose, then we know the Lord eventually is going to judge them. But that's in his hands. Our responsibility is to show mercy. So Jesus disapproved of their attitude. Now, I think another reason why Jesus rebuked them was, was basically this. By, by saying what they said, they were showing that they didn't even understand Jesus. They thought he would approve of what it is that they were saying. You know, don't you agree with us? Jesus, give us that power. Well, let's, let's destroy them right now. But they misunderstood why Jesus had actually come. And Jesus says this, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. We need to understand that his coming into the world 
actually inaugurated the day of God's mercy, not of his judgment. Now, not absolutely, but a day of greater mercy. We do need to remember the angel's announcement to the shepherds at the birth of Jesus. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, this isn't bad news. The day of judgment has come. For born to you in the city of David is a judge who is going to destroy you all. No, this, this is a day of mercy, a day of grace. This is good news. Jesus said of himself in John 3, verse 17, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Again, it is the inauguration of really the day of God's great mercy, greater mercy. Now, some see this as a change in God. Some, some people have a hard time reconciling the God of the New Testament with the God of the Old Testament. They see him basically as being angry and vengeful and destructive in the Old Testament. But in the New, he seems to be so much more merciful. Now, I think we would agree that we do see much more of his mercy in the New Testament because the Lord is much more pleased to show it. Okay, And that's the reason. John even makes note of that in in John 1, verse 17, he says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. But we do need to understand this does not mean that God has changed. God has not changed. Do you realize that God cannot change? God is immutable. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. We know that that's ascribed to Jesus because he is God, right? God never changes. He's the same God now as he was then. God has always been, and He always will be, both just and merciful. He's just, okay? He, he can never overlook sin, not even the smallest sin. He's going to bring everything into account. He cannot deny who He is. He is just. He loves justice. But He has always been and always will be merciful as well. That's the reason why He sent Jesus into the world, because He's merciful. And because he has sent Jesus into the world, he can show mercy because of what Jesus did, because of his atoning death on the cross. And so we need to understand that God was both just and merciful in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. Now, I don't think we have any problem seeing his justice, right? We see that everywhere. He cursed all of mankind because of Adam's sin. As a matter of fact, he cursed the whole creation. And he cast them out of his presence. When he did that, by the way, he cast us out of his presence. You know, if Adam had not sinned, we would have lived with God and heaven and earth would be one. But Adam sinned. We were thrown out of the presence of God. We were cast out of the garden. That is a part of God's justice. God destroyed Egypt because they oppressed his people and refused to let them go. He destroyed the inhabitants of Canaan because of their wickedness. Remember how he didn't let his people go in there until his, the cup of his wrath had reached the fullness. Okay, that shows a little bit of the mercy of God as well. Uh, there, was a, there was an instance in the Bible where uh, we see that some of the Levites actually wanted to become priests and God opened up the ground and swallowed them up alive and fire came out of the tent and burned them to ashes. Uh, there are exhibitions of God's justice and His wrath in the Old Testament. There are plenty of them. But we also need to understand that His mercy was just as clear. Before He cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, He gave them the promise of a Redeemer who would save them. He instituted sacrifices you know, to clothe their nakedness that pointed them to the Redeemer and what it is the Redeemer would do in order to save them so that by looking to Him in faith, even way back then, they could be saved. He delivered his people out of Egypt because of his promises to Abraham. And he gave them the land that he took away from the Canaanites, not only that they might possess it and go in there and live there, but that they might have continually before them a picture of the rest that the Redeemer was going to bring them in, a picture of the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, the Lord preserved the world even after the fall. And he provides for all of his creatures. His mercies are over all. So we see God's mercies in the old covenant, even as we see uh, his justice. 
Now, when it comes to the New Testament, we really don't have any problem seeing the mercy of God. We see it displayed in our Lord Jesus Christ, sending him into the world and his sacrifice on our behalf to suffer and die for our sins that he might save us from hell. Mercy is what we see all over the place, but where do we see his justice in the new covenant? Well, you know, it's still there, isn't it? What happened to Ananias and Sapphira when they lied to the Holy Spirit? about a piece of land and the proceeds. The Lord struck them dead on the spot. Herod one day gave a great speech, and the people cried out, the voice of a God and not of a man, and because Herod took all the glory to himself and didn't give glory to God, an angel was standing by to strike him, and he was basically eaten by worms, and he died. Josephus tells us it took a few days before he died, but it was an agonizing death. God's curse upon him. Uh, What happened to the people of God when they rejected the Messiah? Well, Jerusalem was destroyed, wasn't it? The temple was torn down. Many Jews died in that judgment, and that judgment did come from the Lord. The rest were scattered, again, because they crucified the Son of God. Paul tells us in Romans 1, verse 18, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven every single day. Because of the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men, God is pouring out His wrath on a daily basis, which is why we need to pray for this nation. We do see the wrath of God creeping in on us. The fact that He's giving us over to our sins is actually the sign of His judgment. And of course, in the New Testament, we learn that one day everyone's going to stand before Him to be judged for their sins unless they turn to Jesus. The point is God is always just, And he is always merciful throughout, again, his dealings with mankind. But today is the day of his mercy. And the Lord wants us to declare his mercy, that God is willing to be reconciled to man, that he is willing basically to receive all who will lay down their weapons and come to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants us to reflect that same character, that same nature by being merciful. As I mentioned before, far too often I think we respond to the offenses that are done to us or the ones we see done to Jesus in the same way that James and John uh, responded to these Samaritans. We want basically to see them destroyed, see fire come down from heaven and consume them, but that's the wrong attitude. We do not know what spirit we are of. That's not the Holy Spirit. Basically, that's our flesh desiring to get even or to see things even out, okay? The Lord wants us to show mercy. He wants us to love them. Love those even who offend the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He wants us to love them in the same way that the Father loves them. Listen to what Jesus said already in Luke chapter 6, verses 35 and 36. He says, but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged, and do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Remember what uh, the Lord tells us in the Lord's Prayer? He tells us to pray that we, you know, forgive us as we have forgiven others. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And then Jesus goes on to explain after the Lord's Prayer when he says, for if you do not forgive others their trespasses against you, neither will my heavenly Father forgive you. But if you forgive the trespasses of others, my heavenly Father will forgive you. James already reminded us that justice will be merciless to the one who shows no mercy. We need to show mercy, right? And the Lord has given us the power to do this. Again, let's read this the right way. If we have really trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we have His Spirit living within us, we have the ability to show mercy. We need to yield to the Spirit of God and show that mercy instead of yielding to our flesh and desiring revenge. Remember, nobody gets away with anything, ultimately, in this world, right? Nobody gets away with anything. Every sin is going to be dealt with one way or the other, right? If someone turns to the Lord Jesus Christ and trusts in Him and their sins are forgiven, Jesus has paid the price for that sin. He has already suffered and died 
for that sin. So it's been dealt with, just as, as our sins have been dealt with through Jesus. But if they don't trust in Jesus, God is going to deal with their sins when they die and on the day of judgment. He's going to exact, basically, retribution for every single thing that they have done. And as we know from the Scriptures, their suffering will go on forever and ever. And the reason is because they have sinned against one who is infinitely worthy and being able only to suffer in a limited way, that suffering must be eternal and they will never pay what they owe to God's justice. God will show, basically he'll deal with it in justice one way or the other, either through his son or through their suffering. So God will take care of it. As for us, we need to show mercy. Now, again, we get a little bit of an epilogue here. After Jesus rebuked his disciples, James and John, for their suggestion, they went on to another village. So instead of destroying them in his anger, Jesus said, let's find another village, okay, where we can find a place for the night. Jesus, again, expressing his mercy and his patience toward the Samaritans. And he tells us, go and do likewise. Well, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us do what he calls us to do.